it is. But Sunday mornings is our time to come before the Lord and really bring our worship. So I just wanted to take a moment. I'd invite you to stand up. Let's prepare our hearts for, the, for our God, for the Almighty King. Lord, we come before you, humbled, God, that, 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 uh, that you loved us, Lord, that in you is all that we need, God. Lord, I pray for this morning as we, as we lift up a worship to you that it would bless your name, that it would be pleasing to your ears. Yes, God. Thank you, Lord.
Matthew chapter 2, verse 10. The New King James renders this, this description of the wise men as they pursued Jesus. It says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. They rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And just as, as we sing this song about, about joy, joy to the world, I'm convicted about being weighed down by things and, and not always being as full of joy as we ought to be in light of the reality that the creator of the universe has made a way for us to have fellowship with him, to have fellowship with each other. Like we are standing here today because of the grace of Jesus Christ. I just want to stir us, church. Man, the portion of God for us is joy, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, to rejoice this morning with exceedingly great joy. And maybe you're standing here even singing these words, kind of like, ah, oh, God, I just feel like I'm discombobulated. Lord, work something in us that we can just rejoice at the reality that you are God and you are good and you are with us and you are for us. We rejoice in you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Speak up a joy, an overflowing well, an overflowing well, no tongue can tell, no tongue can tell, joy, unspeak up a joy, it rises, it rises in my soul, never lets me go.
Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let's just give him a clap offering this morning. Thank you, God. You are good. You are worthy, Lord. Amen. Thanks, Camilla. Thanks, Jamie. He is good. You guys can have a seat. You know, Luis and I were talking... Uh, two mornings ago, I think, just about the bigness of God and how he, he is, He was, He is to come. He, it's just like really hard to get your mind around how big our God is and how marvelous He is and um, just what He has control of. Uh, we, we try to, I'll say, dumb it down to our, our mankind version, but He's so much bigger than, than anything that we can, than we can even imagine. It's, it's really incredible. All right, well, I just want to welcome you here this morning. If it's your first time, do we have any first-time visitors? I don't see anybody. All right, well, welcome again, uh, friends and guests. Um, no need to go through the notes Jamie has on me for, for a, a new-time visitors. <laughs> cool. Well, um, I wanted to switch gears a little bit. Speaking of notes, this isn't on my, um, my outline, Jamie, so, um, you know, uh, there's a scripture, what's that? Yeah, that'd be helpful. Sorry. I can't multitask. Ask anybody close to me, like Rick. <laughs> um, yeah, so I wanted to read a scripture this morning that, uh, that, that Louisa and I um, were talking about, and I think she had communicated this to a few folks in the church. Um, but we beseech you, brethren, to know them that labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them exceeding highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. This morning, uh, we're going to take a few minutes. Some of the, the folks in the church wanted to uh, just celebrate and give thanks to our, our Pastor Jamie. Um, this is the week of Thanksgiving. So, you know, I, I was thinking back um, personally, all the things, Jamie, that, that you mean to me and what I'm thankful for for you, but I'm thinking, okay, over the last four years, we've had about four different building locations. <laughs> we've had um, two different rental agreements that you've had to negotiate, a building that we've purchased, a lawsuit, 
Um, there's just like so many things that we've, we've kind of had to go through over the last four years, and you've helped lead us, guide us, give us wisdom. Um, and and I've, I've experienced it both from a membership perspective, but also on the elder side of things. And I'm just so thankful for your mind, for how you process things, um, for the wisdom and the resource that we have in you. And in the midst of all that, how you're just so steadfast and able to get up here every Sunday, preach the word. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, I'm so thankful for you, Jamie. And uh, there, I've been getting lots of feedback. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get through all the, the messages I have from folks in the church, but I wanted to open up to folks in the room if there's anybody that wants to share something. Um, Eric, go ahead. Yeah, come on up because we're streaming. So I think we'll want people to, to hear what you're saying. Yeah, thanks. I yeah. actually wrote it down so I don't... <laughs> I don't forget, I'm not that good at I can remember things, but Jamie does mean a lot to um, has got to be one of the hardest jobs in the world, especially today. Um, and you have done a magnificent job, and I'm so grateful for your humble service, integrity, and endurance. In um, your years of service to the church, you have proven time and again that you were called by God to do this work, from the first meetings in the Crookshanks basements to fighting for our right to worship in this building. And now, through the challenges of COVID, uh, you've brought in us, you've continued to exemplify God's word. Um, and thanks for everything you do as a pastor. And know that I'm always praying for you, and I'm thankful for you and your job. Adrian, do you have something? I'm thankful that he's our pastor. All right. <laughs> Judy, in the back. I wrote some things down too. Every pastor faces scrutiny, critical observation. What they do is always under a microfying, magnifying glass. So this is what I found. <laughs> pastor Jamie treasures and guards his walk with the Lord. In Revelation, there is a finding that the church of Ephesus had lost their first love. I don't know all they were doing or not doing, but I, and probably everybody here, has observed that Pastor Jamie has not lost his first love. His daily walk, walks in uh, joy and passion for loving Jesus and serving the church. It's hard to even bring a negative thing, a negative issue to him, because you don't want to disturb that joy in him. That's what I find always in him, a passion, and that it's a steady passion. Americans, I think, are kind of desensitized to many things, but Pastor Jamie remains emotional for Jesus. And he's joyful in his salvation, always. It's inspiring, actually. It's an inspiring quality. I believe it's his desire that that first love be a contagion, contagious passion in us, as it is in him. So, Pastor Jamie, thank you for imparting that week after week. I hope that we all catch the fire you have. Okay, Jamie, we've known each other for 13 years, and we lived together for 10 of those, seven of those in the same bedroom, <clears throat> and uh, I just wanted to thank you for all the various seasons that I've packed into my life over the last 13 years. You've had wisdom in all of them, and I just want to recall a prophetic word that's significant to Camilla and I. We received it uh, about six and a half years ago right after we got married, 
and uh, we are getting prophetic ministry. You were not. But the prophet had called you out of whatever you were doing and like brought you to us and was like, you are a tripod, the three of you, Camilla, Carson, Jamie. And he was like, the, the tripod is a sturdy, solid shape. And similarly, you will kind of be to one another a, a strength. And then like a month later, you moved in to live with us at that particular time. And I just want to recall that, that we don't forget that, that word and, and our coming to Canton and you coming to Canton. I don't know that we were like, well, we have to fulfill the tripod. Um, but we continue to have this relationship, um, which will continue to continue. <laughs> And so I just want to thank you for, in every season, continuing to pour in your wisdom. And we're excited to see how this tripod word continues to work itself out. Thank you. Thanks, Carson. Anyone else? Darcy. I appreciate you. <laughs> the Velez family appreciates you. And I'm pretty certain everyone in this room appreciates you. On a personal standpoint with the Velez family, you've, done, you've gone out of your way to help my kids. Um, as you guys know, like every once in a while, we're coming up and congratulating uh, scouting stuff. And, and Jamie brings them closer. He brings a different perspective. And even though there's a curriculum he follows, it, it's always Jamie. You know, He brings in the Jamie Sinclair. To whatever he does. And we appreciate that. What I want people to really understand, I don't know how many of you have experienced different congregations and different pastors, but I've, I've been in a handful of different ones. And wow, Jamie, like, I don't know if you know how special you are. I don't know you know of, there are people out there that have a calling to pastor, and every one of them is a human. And every one of them has sin in their heart someplace. And some of them act on it more than others. And I don't know every good and bad thing you've done in your life, but you exemplify someone who is a follower of Christ. And it's, I think you may understand to what impact you have on people's lives. But when you are searching and you need your soul to connect, and you have a pastor that doesn't bring you to that. When you find someone that does, it's just, it's amazing. And when I was 13 and I was going through confirmation, my pastor and I was very doubtful. I was very agnostic at the time. And my pastor gave me three choices. Um, either don't confirm, you change your mind in a week, or you do it anyway. And wow, what a turn off that was not only to, to the pastor, but to Christianity in general. If this is what this leader who's supposed to bring me closer to God says. And I've known other pastors that have fallen out of grace with doing more sinful things. And um, it's it just, you're not that person. You have an integrity that runs so deep in your soul. You have a joy that runs so deep in your soul. And despite you not having pastored for 50 years, it's like you have. It's like you just have this internal wisdom that, that I don't care what your age is. It's just, I want to follow you. And my kids want to follow you and my husband. And we just, it, it, just keep doing what you're doing, Jamie. You, you have a, an impact that is just rippling. And, and it not just you know from you to me, but from me to my kids and my kids to other kids. It just keeps going and going. So just hang strong. I know that you've got to have days that you're like, why did I choose to do this? But just you're doing the right thing. You're doing it great. And just keep doing it. Thank you so much, Jamie. Well put, Darcy. You're special, Jamie. Um, William, you have something? Come on up. Well, I haven't been here as long as some of you guys, but 
just one conversation with Jamie, you can just tell he's a really kind and smart person. He's funny. He's just, he's impacted a lot of people, and he's just so kind to everyone. Like, I don't have as much to say, but thank you, Jamie. I really respect you. Yeah. Thanks, William. I'm thankful for that Uncle Jamie shares good things for us. <laughs> All right. Julia, you have something? I like really haven't been here as long, but Jamie is like the nicest pastor I've ever been through. Like I've been through a lot of pastors, like Louisiana, I can remember that, but he was the best one of all the pastors I've been through in my eight years of life. He's really kind, caring, nice, sociable, smart, and I can't name it all. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Julia. All right, well, I don't, I don't want to stop this, but uh, we do have a message ahead of us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, let's take some time now. We'll pray for Jamie. Um, Jamie, we have a card that we want to give you as well. Um, on behalf of everyone at the church, I'll leave it right here uh, for you. It's just a gift from us. We just wanted to tell you that we love you. I affirm everything that everybody's been saying. You're, you're really a, a great guy. Um, so why don't we do, we'll do a time of prayer, we'll release the children, and then um, I'd encourage you to continue to go up and tell Jamie, you know, what you appreciate about him, um, just pour out your love on him today, let's, let's really just love him up uh, as our pastor today. Sound good? So, uh, Jamie, if you could come up, if anybody wants to come up and join me and, and Greg, um, we'll just spend some time praying for Jamie. Here, really briefly. <laughs> sure. Hey, I, I, don't, I can't say much, but I really appreciate the encouragement and the, the uh, it's, it, this has been encouraging. It's definitely been a hard season for many of us, and it's been a hard year for me, and this is really encouraging, so thank you very much. It's, it's awesome serving Jesus with you all. I just, I was waiting to come up here. I, I don't really have anything to add much uh, from what everybody said. I think, Darcy, what you said um, I don't think Jamie chose this as much as he was chosen to do this, and I think that's what makes it so obvious. And just a couple of things that have, that have helped me and inspired me is two things, and it's uh, grace and authenticity. I mean, what you see is what you get, uh, very authentic, and I so appreciate that, and the grace is a great example to me because I don't always feel as graceful toward certain persons or, or certain issues, and I, you know, I, I hear Jamie, and he's just... He has so much grace for, for people and for me, and I just, uh, I'm so appreciative of that. So he's not an OG, but he's an AG here. He's authentic grace. So go ahead. All right. Um, Greg, you want to open us up? I'll, I'll leave it open. If you just want to pray, you can just, you can just stand up and pray, and, um, and then I'll close. Father, we thank you for this man. We thank you that you have called him, and he has answered that call, uh, and he's answered it fully and completely, uh, all in, all the time, and we're so appreciative of that, Lord, and we just ask that you pour your spirit and grace out in him, continue to do so, uh, give him strength in these difficult times, uh, give him wisdom in these difficult times, uh, continue to give him grace for, for um, himself, in, in difficult times where he's wondering and he questions himself, Lord, uh, grace for himself. And uh, Lord, I am just so thankful that you've called him and that uh, he's a part of this and, and that I'm a part of this congregation, Lord. So we're so thankful, so thankful, Lord.
All right, if you guys just want to reach out your hands, though, I just want to pray a blessing on Jamie. Lord, we thank you for this man. Um, and God, we ask for your blessing over him in the, in the days to come, God. We thank you for the, the last three to four years that we've had with him, Lord, but we just pray um, that that would just be a stepping stone and that he'd be propelled um, into this next season, God. We just pray for continued wisdom, continued protection, um, and blessing on his life, God. In your name we pray, amen. amen. All right. Okay, so uh, again, the plan will uh, dismiss children here. If you are a, if you have a, ch a child between the ages of four and eight, um, we have a children's program that I think started last week. Um, so I will take a few moments now and release you as parents just to sign your children in. Um, if you're not familiar, it's through the bar or through that door and that way, and then we'll meet back here in about five minutes. Thanks.
All right. Just want to ask you to slowly migrate back to your seats. If you're in the bar, grab a coffee quick and then come on in. Well, great. Um, good service so far. This is, this is good. Uh, a few announcements that we want to cover this morning. Uh, so last week, I think was the first week we discussed it, but uh, Christine Thrasher had an idea um, of Christmas presents. We couldn't come up with a name with it. Apparently, there's been a name uh, chosen, and that is Operation Christmas Kindness. Sounds really like strategic. I like it. So uh, that's the new name that we're going to be referring to that. And great news on that. All the tags that were out on the tables, if you noticed last week, have been claimed. So that's great. Thank you, church. Um, This is an opportunity for us to really uh, spread our tentacles out into the community and uh, to really sow into kids that might not necessarily be in this room. So thank you. Um, There's a collection basket in the bar area. I think it's, uh, Greg, where is it exactly? It's right on that under the map, um, the map for our, our mission. So uh, you should be able to see it. it's, a, it's a large basket and it's uh, labeled as well. So as you have presents, drop them off there. Um, if there are any questions, please connect with Christine. Um, we can provide her number to you if you need that. Okay, next announcement. So uh, tis the season, right? Christmas is coming. Uh, we're going to do a Christmas Eve service this year right here at Canton. Um, so, December 24th, Christmas Eve, at 7 p.m. I wanted to make sure I got the, uh, I didn't want, yeah, <laughs> I got that one memorized pretty well. Um, and we're just going to celebrate Jesus. We're going to have some um, uh, time of worship, some singing. Uh, it's going to be a great service, so I'd encourage you to, to come out to that. All right, with everything that's going on with COVID, we're not passing around a basket, but there is a giving basket in the back there, so... Uh, if you have a check that you wanted to give, drop it off there. If you, if you give online, cfconline.org slash give. And I think that's all the announcements we have. So let's welcome our Pastor Jamie. Ah. Amen. Good morning. John, I left my iPad back there charging. Would you please bring it up for me? By the way, John's pretty amazing too. Uh, Give him some love. Thank you for serving, John. Excellent. Well, today is the first Sunday of Advent. And in Advent, certainly it's, it's a special season, lots of, uh, lots of special celebration, and rightfully focused on Jesus and the coming of the Lord Jesus. It's really significant. Last Advent season, we spent several Sundays just looking at uh, the reality that for hundreds of years, even a couple millennia, the people of God had been looking forward to the coming of Jesus. And now we look back and we we celebrate and we give thanks for Jesus' coming. But similarly, here we are looking forward to Jesus' second coming or second advent. And uh, it's it's a fun season full of thanksgiving and celebration, but also anticipation and expectation. Uh, This year, as, as we celebrate the Lord coming... Lord coming and making a way and just the gospel and what that means. I wanted to key in on the idea of worship. I referenced Matthew chapter 2 earlier, and we're going to be looking at that as kind of a theme for the next few weeks. Uh, But before we dive into that, I did want to acknowledge just the reality that there is a surge in COVID cases in the North Country, and that means different things to different people depending on where you work and what your job is. But I just wanted to take a minute and pray uh, I, I know people who have tested positive, you probably do too. I want to pr- pray certainly for health. I want to pray for those who are working. I was just talking to Robin about the, the state of things at the hospital. and um, So let, let's just pray for that. Let's pray for wisdom for us in this season, but also recognize that this is a season with, you know, there's, there's increased challenges. You know, some even streaming right now just because, in order to be, be careful about the virus, but that 
There's an opportunity for loneliness or disconnect. I'm thankful for technology and ways to, to connect in the midst of that, but it's going to require some extra effort and focus, and certainly we need the grace of God in the midst of this. So let's pray. Amen. Lord Jesus, Lord, I thank you that we can bring things to you. Lord, that we can cast our cares before you, for you care for us. And so, Lord, we come this day. Lord, I pray for those who are sick, uh, maybe, maybe even hospitalized. Lord God, I pray for strength. I pray for health by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for, uh, Lord, I pray for those who are missing work right now. Lord, that you would just minister to their souls. Use this season of uncertainty, season of concerns and frustrations. Lord, I pray, would you use this to draw people's attention to yourself? Lord, I pray for an awakening in this area, Lord Jesus, for men and women and children to give their lives to you, Jesus. Lord, I pray for those who are on, on the front lines and in healthcare and emergency response and things like that. Lord, I pray for wisdom. I pray for strength. Lord Jesus, minister to them, I pray. Lord, we trust you in this season. We trust you, Lord. And Lord, I thank you for your word. And I just pray as we study this morning, Lord, that we would grow in understanding. Our understanding would be enlarged. Lord, and I pray that we would be a people who are not hearers only, but doers. Lord, I pray that we would walk this out, walk out lives submitted to you. Amen. So Matthew chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, speaking of the wise men who are traveling to see the young child, when they saw the star they were overwhelmed with joy. This is not the New King James. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Uh, we might speak a little bit to the gifts at some point later in the season, but for now, I just want to key in on this reality. They worshipped him. They worshipped him. And the word there is it's to worship or to pay homage to like a superior. It's literally, it means to face towards like a dog. So like the picture is almost like a dog might lick their owner's hand type thing. It's to worship. And so here they are, they see this baby and they worship. It would have been a bit of a spectacle maybe in the moment, but when you understand who this child is, it's right and it's fitting, and we too today, we join and we worship Jesus. This is good and it's right, and the reality is we've been created by God as worshipers. We've been created for a worship relationship with the Lord, and we have this ability in us. It's part of how God's wired us, you could say. We've been wired as uh, value-seeking beings who, who recognize value and have priorities. And the truth is, if you like say, I have no values or priorities, well, now you are your priority and you just do what you want. And maybe laziness and thoughtlessness is your idol. Uh, but, but like we are wired for worship. We were created by God to worship. And what we're going to do in a few minutes is, is read some sections out of the book of Revelation, pictures of uh, just beings created by the Lord, certainly men and women like us, but also angelic beings worshiping in the throne room. But before we jump to the picture in Revelation, I want to take a moment and think about that reality, that the way God has created us is to be worshipers. Um, a couple of times recently, I feel like I've differentiated or, or explained the difference between special revelation and general revelation. Special revelation refers to things that we know through special means, like the scriptures. Uh, like what, what we're reading out of the scripture is this is special. You wouldn't know this except that you have the Bible. General revelation refers to the reality that God is the creator and he's created a world that's orderly. And not only that, it's a world that when you look at the world God created, you see his divine power on display. The book of Romans says that in chapter 1. Uh, th that just looking up into the heavens, it declares the glory of God. There's, as we explore his creation, as we use the minds he's created us with, we can learn truth. It's revealed to us generally. There's also a lot of truth we learn that's been revealed specially, like, through scripture. But briefly, uh, philosophers through the ages 
Christian philosophers has, have spent time thinking about what can we know by thinking. And they, they've come to, to several, they've formalized several arguments regarding the existence of God, and a few of them try to outright prove God's existence. But what it is, is it's people who are good with their minds, thinking, what can you know just by using the gift that God has given us, our mental faculties? And one family of uh, arguments for God's existence is it's called the cosmological argument. And it essentially looks at the universe and says, why is there something rather than nothing? Like, what's the explanation for this universe that we live in, in a nutshell? And one specific form of this is everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist Therefore, the universe has a cause. Now, my purpose in sharing this this morning is not to explain this argument, so if you're really curious to hear how these premises would be defended, we can chat later. Uh, but, but what's interesting about this argument is it doesn't simply make a case that the universe exists, but something must have caused it, but it actually implies some things about that cause. It must have been powerful to create the universe. Furthermore, the universe is space-time, so it must be beyond space and time. You might say it's timeless and it's immaterial and it's powerful. And not only that, if it was uh, determined to have caused this universe from timelessly in the past, then the universe would have always existed, but in proving premise number two, you prove the universe hasn't always existed. Therefore, this must have created the universe some finite period ago and chosen to. So you can actually deduce that the cause of the universe is powerful, timeless, immaterial, and personal. And by personal, it means that it has agency, that it's not just a thing that was programmed to create the universe, it was an agent or a being that chose to create. Does that make sense? And again, I'm very cursory. Another field of arguments have to do with design. Saying, not only why does something exist rather than nothing, but it says, why does it exist this way? We live in a pretty remarkable universe. It's pretty amazing. Like when you, when you look at some of the de detail and some of the vastness, it's just overwhelming. And not only that, some of the precision. Do you realize if, the, if gravity were just a little, little, little bit stronger, the universe would collapse. And if it were a little, little bit weaker, it would never have coagulated into you know, galaxies and solar systems and planets. And, and so it's very precise. And, and this is how the argument goes when formalized. The fine-tuning of the initial conditions of the universe is due to either law, chance, or design. The fine-tuning is not due to law or chance. Therefore, the fine-tuning is due to design. And again, I'm not sharing this to defend this here. If you're interested, we could talk about it some other time. It's a little bit maybe more nerdy than my typical Sunday morning sermon, uh, and, and not as Bible-centric. Uh, but what's something that we can learn generally from this? We already saw that the cause of the universe was personal, powerful, immaterial, timeless. And this adds, not only did it choose to create the universe, but it chose to create this universe. It's not like there was some being that accidentally created a random universe. Because this is a special universe that's very, very precisely fine-tuned. Uh, it's, it's extraordinarily improbable that the universe that we inhabit would exist unless it was made on purpose. There's another set of arguments about the existence of God. They're called the moral arguments for God's existence. And a, a one version of the moral argument is this. If God does not exist, objective moral values or well, I usually say objective moral values and duties do not exist. I copy-pasted this. Objective moral values and duties do exist, therefore God exists. And again, my purpose in sharing this is not to defend the argument. We can talk about it some other time. But what does this say about this creator of the universe? Not only is he powerful, timeless, immaterial, personal, and intentional in his creation, but he's good. He's good. And, and not only that, I think furthermore, we can add a couple more things as we look at his creation. We can look at ourselves, one another, and say, not only is God good, but he's created. Humans are special compared to the rest of creation. We understand good. We understand wrong. We can see an injustice, 
and we can see something that's beautiful. We've been created with moral agency. And not only that, we find within ourselves that we are purpose-seeking and worshiping beings. We were created for something more than just to exist for 70 years, and you know it. There's something that God deposited in our hearts. The Bible says that God placed eternity in the heart of man. Like, but you can see that. You don't even have to look at the Bible to recognize, man, we're looking for something bigger than these 70 years on the planet. Because God wired us that way. We were wired to worship. Yeah. Several years ago, I heard Daniel Paladin, the pastor at the Potsdam location, talking about worship, and he noted, cheetahs do not sit around observing other cheetahs running really, really quickly. And be like, wow, did you see Joey the cheetah? Joey's are kangaroos, aren't they? I don't know. What, what are cheetahs called? Can anybody give me a name for a cheetah? Chester the cheetah, you're good, Darcy. So Chester the cheetah, wow. Did you see he did zero to 60 and I don't know what cheetahs do, four seconds, like they're, they're insanely fast, right? But like, they, they don't do that because cheetahs were not wired to worship. But human beings were like, wow, that meal was awesome. Wow, did you see that three-point shot? Wow, did, like we're, we're wired to be wowed and amazed and awed because we were wired to worship. And we're looking for purpose and meaning that not only fills our lives, but even transcends them because we were created for an eternal, worshipful relationship with our creator. And you can kind of come to that just by looking at the beautiful and intricate and absolutely mind-blowingly amazing creation of our God. We were wired for worship. In fact, the question is not if we will worship, but whom or what we will worship. We are worshiping beings, and we all have ultimate priorities. Like I said, even if your ultimate priority is doing nothing and thinking about nothing, your idol is, is laziness, and actually, ultimately, in that case, your idol is you, and you getting to decide what matters, and what matters is doing nothing. Like, we have some sort of priority. It's the way God made us. We necessarily, by definition, are worshiping something all the time, but we were created to worship Jesus. We were created to walk with Jesus. Uh, Tim Keller is a pastor down in New York City, and he has some uh, great work on idolatry, the concept of idolatry. He's really done some good Bible study on that. And one of the things he's written is this. In the beginning, human beings were made to worship and serve God and to rule over all created things in God's name. But he continues... One of the main ways to read the Bible is as the ages-long struggle between true faith and idolatry. We were created to worship God, but what we see playing out through the story of Scripture is humans, do I go my way, do I chase idols, or do I submit myself to the true God? It's kind of the story of Scripture. So a brief aside regarding idolatry in 1 John chapter 5, the Apostle John gives just this simple admonition. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. And what an idol is, is when where God is supposed to be ultimate in our lives, when we take anything else, and it can be something heinous and obviously a warping of God's design, but it could even be a good thing when we take anything other than God, and make it ultimate. It's idolatry. Just a, a short brainstorm. Like, the list is too long to, to con consider for long what idolatry might look like. But certainly in our context today, in America, and probably in many other contexts, but I know our context, material wealth is a common idol. You know what's amazing? You can be... I'm not trying to say anything specifically about Jeff Bezos. I'm not friends with him. But you, you could be Jeff Bezos or you could be not able to make ends meet. Both persons could have material wealth as an idol, as an obsession, as their ultimate priority in life. Also, you could be a billionaire and not have material wealth as an idol. Or you can be impoverished and not have as an idol, an idol. It's not about how much, it's about the, the place it occupies in your affections, your devotions, what you're looking to for salvation. The question is, is God ultimate 
Or is it a, a pursuit of material wealth, either for status or for comfort? Um, what about instant gratification? And I differentiate this. Certainly, money can kind of come into play with almost every idol. But uh, instant gratification, I don't think social media helps on this one. You post something, you check back five minutes later, anybody like it? Yeah. <laughs> you want that like instant, it's feeding something. And there's nothing wrong with posting something or someone liking that post. But man, it can so easily become an idol. We can chase that for all sorts of things. Uh, any sort of social success in your careers and in organizations. Family can be an idol. Family is part of God's design. Family is good. We are called to provide for our families. But the reality is, when our family is ultimate in our lives, and it's not Jesus, we, we took a good thing and we just made it an idol. Jesus said in Luke 14, 26, and he's speaking hyperbolically, but to make a point, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That's a strong statement. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own, his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Again, this is about priorities. Jesus isn't saying uh, dislike or treat poorly. He's saying, relatively speaking, compared to the ultimate position that the Lord has in our lives, it's like we hate everything else, relatively speaking. Speaking hyperbolically to make a point, but family can be an idol. Romantic relationships, talents, pursuing various, again, skills that maybe the Lord's given you, they can become idols. Ministry can become an idol. Family is a significant ministry, and it can become an idol. Well, sadly, many who've had public ministries have sacrificed their families on the altar of that ministry. That itself is idolatry. Uh, your, your commitment to preaching the word or, or doing what the Lord's called you to could become an idol and you start chasing after that more than you're chasing after the Lord. So many things can become an idol. And, and the reason it's easy to slip into these idolatries is because we've been wired to worship. If it weren't for the fact that, that, that God designed us to worship, we wouldn't... Cheetahs don't struggle with idolatry, <laughs> but they weren't wired to worship. It wasn't part of God's design for them. What I want to do now is look at a, a, two pictures of worship in the book of Revelation. And then I want to take a few more minutes to respond in worship to the Lord corporately. But these pictures are beautiful, they're grand, and what they are is this. They are an illustration, a specific example or outworking of the reality that we, you and I, have been called to worship. That, that example of the wise men 2,000 years ago, as they bowed and worshipped the child, Jesus, that wasn't unique to that situation. You and I are called to worship today. Revelation chapter 4, verse 2, if you would turn there with me. That battle was Camilla's. Amen. Revelation chapter 4, verse 2. The Apostle John is writing. He's receiving a vision from the Lord. And it starts in Revelation 1. And actually, the book of Revelation, in case you never thought about it, it's a revelation. It's, it's, a, it's a vision from the Lord, so revealing some, some understanding to John. And uh, here in chapter 4, we see John receiving this vision, and, and this part of the vision is a vision of the throne room of God and worship. And then we're going to jump into Revelation chapter 7, which continues a, a revelation of worship and a worship of the Lord, but specifically looking way forward and seeing, well, you'll know when we get there. Revelation chapter 4, verse 2. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and there was a throne in heaven, and someone was seated on it. The one seated there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian stone. A rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald surrounded the throne. Around the throne were 24 thrones, 
And on the throne sat 24 elders dressed in white clothes with golden crowns on their heads. Flashes of lightning and rumblings of, and peals of thunder came from the throne. Seven fiery torches were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Something like a sea of glass, similar to crystal, was also before the throne. Four living creatures covered with eyes in front and in back were around the throne on each side. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like an ox. The third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. They were covered with eyes around and inside. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, 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 Lord God the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to the one seated on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before the one seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne and say, Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things. And by your will they exist and were created. So this picture is, it's a beautiful picture of worship and some uh, just beings beyond our ordinary experience. And it's, it's certainly awing and it's a picture of God's holiness and his glory and, and just the beauty and power of worship. But what's especially interesting as the revelation continues in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, John looks and see what he sees. After this, I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and along with the elders and the four living creatures, they fell face down before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. We, one day, are going to be part of a multitude, worshiping the Lord, declaring, I mean, we get to do it in part now, but man, there's going to be something awaiting us in eternity. We don't fully understand exactly what it's going to look like. We have glimpses like this picture in Revelation chapter 7. But there's going to be a multitude of people from around the globe representing all sorts of peoples, all sorts of languages. And I don't know if we're going to say it all at the same time in different languages or have some sort of like one lingua franca that's heavenly. I don't know how it'll work. But we're going to worship Jesus. And this isn't some sort of new, peculiar, oh, like, hey, I've got something new for you now that you're sharing eternity with me. The Lord has created us as worshipers from the beginning. From the get-go, it's part of how God's wired us, and he's calling us to worship today. What the wise men did wasn't uh, intended to be unique or peculiar or specific to that moment. Maybe the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But the notion of worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the, notion, the, the idea that we ought to worship our creator, that is for us today. It's right. It's good. We were wired. We were created by God to worship to have relationship with him where he is ultimates. And so this day, church, this reality that we are wired to worship, it's something for us to recognize, to celebrate, to give thanks to the Lord for, but it's also a sobering call away from idols that might pull for our attention, affection, devotion. There might even be a need for some repentance on our part here as we sit today and realize there are areas in my life where Jesus is not ultimate. Repent. Turn to Jesus. The mercies of God are new every morning. And there's a call for us. Let's engage. We don't need to wait until Jesus returns to worship. We can worship this day. And part of our ministry, I say it once in a while, and I almost want to preach it every Sunday because it's so significant, but part of our ministry, when we gather together, uh, certainly we're gathering to learn 
We're gathering to encourage one another. We're gathering to get something. But man, that is so secondary to the reality that we are gathering together to bless Jesus, to bring something to the Lord. In the Old Testament, there was a, a class, the Levitical priesthood, who served the Lord. We, we looked at the story of Uzziah last week, and he actually stepped in and began serving in ways he should not have. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, what we realize is that in the new covenant, every one of us is a priest. And we have a responsibility to serve the Lord, to bless him. So we're going to close with uh, just a, a prayer of dedication of ourselves to the Lord in this ministry. And then I want to call Camilla back up to lead us as we corporately spend a few minutes say, we're going to engage in this now. We were wired for worship, Lord, our lives are yours. And as we gather together this day, we're blessing Jesus. We're bringing an offering of praise to the one who created us, the one who claimed us, the one who's given his own life that we might live. Let's worship. Jesus, I thank you for your goodness. Lord, I thank you for your good design. Lord, you are the one who created the heavens and the earth, who created us, men and women in your image. Lord, you put eternity in our hearts. You created us as, as value-seeking, purpose-seeking, worshiping beings because you've designed us for a worship relationship with you, our creator. Lord, this day as we recognize this truth, Lord, where there is idolatry in our hearts, Lord, uh, even good things that we've made ultimate Lord, I pray, would you give us, grant us repentance in this moment. Holy Spirit, would you bring revelation, specific revelation to our hearts right now. Lord, we surrender to you, submit our lives to you. Lord, I thank you for the ministry of worship, the opportunity we have to, to bless you, to honor you, to bring to you something pleasing and beautiful, something good and right. Lord, I thank you for the, the, the gifts, that, the, the faculties you've given us to express worship. And we want to exercise those for your glory. Amen. Hey, if you would, please stand to your feet. Let's close with a, a worship chorus or two.
praises. And I sing praises to you, Lord. Hallelujah. What a privilege to gather to worship Jesus, to bless his name. One day we'll probably spend much longer periods of time worshiping with the elders and those poor beings covered in eyes. Uh, what a study, but what a privilege, what an honor. The Lord is worthy. Amen. Amen. Hey, I'm going to dismiss the service at this time. I want to invite you to go in the peace of the Lord, encourage one another. If you'd like prayer for anything specific, we'll have some members of the prayer team up front, and uh, it's a joy to pray with you. Amen. Be blessed.